Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's seminar. And I'm very pleased uh, to have Dr. Yestin Barr with us today. Uh, so Yestin is at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and he's on strike, obviously. Like, like <laughs> um, so Yestin is a, a glaciologist uh, who uses remote sensing uh, almost uh, entirely <laughs> for his work, uh, interested particularly in glacial geomorphology. Um, has done a lot of work looking at paleoglaciology, so reconstructing past glacial environments. Um, and today, obviously, he's going to talk about his, his project, which is looking a little bit more towards the modern, um, which is volcanoes uh, which have glaciers on top of them. And I'm not going to say any more than that because I don't know anymore. Um, <laughs> in terms of a brief resume of Yeston's career, he did his undergraduate at the University of Lancaster before a master's at uh, University of Liverpool in Environment and Climate Change, PhD at University of Sheffield, which was looking at far northeast Russian glaciation, um, looking back to uh, last glacial maximum, and then had various teaching positions at Liverpool John Moores, Queen Mary, University of London, which is where we, we met actually. I think after Claire's time, Claire was at QM as well, but had you left by then? I can't remember. No, some over that. Some over that with Claire as well. Um, and then Queen's Belfast uh, for current position at Manchester Metropolitan. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, welcome and yes, enjoy. Thanks a lot, Harold. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks all for coming and for those of you listening at home. Uh, if you have any trouble hearing me at any point, let me know or if you have trouble seeing me, obviously, um, feel free to interrupt me and um, to resolve that. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today actually is the interactions between glaciers and volcanoes, and I'm going to, at least to some degree, assume that this is a new topic to you. Um, it's a new topic to most people I speak to about glacial volcano interactions. So I'm going to start, as I'll show you in a moment, with an introduction to the topic as a whole and explain a little bit why I think it's important. Then go on to think about some of the work we're actually doing at the moment. And this is ongoing work, so there are some findings, but there'll be some moments when you want me to tell you something conclusive and I might leave you hanging a little bit, but that might be something we can talk about. And um, I'm not alone in the work I'm doing here. There are various other people with me on this project, and it's supported by both Leverhulme and NERC. Um, a lot of the, the images I use in this talk are actually from the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program website. Excellent website for anyone who wants to know about volcanoes um, in general. But just to make that point now, a lot of these photos are from there. And uh, this happens to be a photo of a, a gratuitously beautiful photograph, I think. <laughs> of a, a volcano in Kamchatka in Eastern Russia. And what you see here actually is a, a volcano erupting through a glacier. And we have lava flowing across the glacier surface and then all the way around the side of it. And for a lot of my talk, this particular example isn't, isn't that relevant, although we can think about it. Um, it just happens to be a great photo, um, hence it being here. And it is the interaction between a glacier and a volcano. That's for certain. Um, try and move on. Yeah, sorry. So I'll, just as a quick overview of the talk, uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to glaciers and volcanoes and how they interact. And I'll use the term glacier volcanism, which is generally the term that's used when we talk about glaciers and volcanoes interacting. It's not a great word, I don't think. Um, but there's a, a really good book um, published a couple of years ago about glacier volcanism on Earth and Mars. And if you have any further interest, this is definitely where I would begin my reading. Um, and when I talk about glacier volcanism, what I really am talking about is what happens to a glacier when a volcano erupts underneath it or very close to it, or what happens to a glacier when there's geothermal heating without an eruption, or what happens to a volcano if something happens to a glacier. Like, does melting a glacier mean that you're more likely to have a volcanic eruption based on what's underneath the ice, basically? And what I will come on to that. So it's not just what the volcano does to the glacier that matters, it's what the glaciers can do to the volcano. And these things are interlinked. Um, I'll hopefully start by emphasizing that really having a glacier on your volcano is normally a bad thing. It makes the, the impact of the eruption far worse. You get loads of melting, you get floods, you get lahars. I'll emphasize that point to start with. Um, it's also a problem if you're a volcanologist who wants to observe a, gla uh, sorry, observe a volcano directly. If you want to check whether there's geothermal heating, whether there is tilting, whether there's anything going on to your volcano, covering with a, it with a glacier is a bad thing. It makes that much more difficult. I'll make that point. I'll emphasize that point. 
Then I'll go on to what our project is really about, actually, which is to say, yeah, we know that glaciers are a problem when it comes to monitoring volcanoes, but perhaps glaciers are also useful. Um, glaciers respond to what the volcano is doing. So can we observe the glaciers to make some inferences about what's going on underneath, volcanologically speaking? Uh, and that's what the whole project is about. Are glaciers actually useful in terms of telling us something about volcanoes? And then I'll, I'll conclude by finally thinking about what happens to glacier volcanism, this whole area of research, in a future world when glaciers are smaller? Does that mean they're no longer relevant in terms of volcanic eruptions generating lahars, for example? Or are there other things we need to think about? What, what is the future of glacier volcanism, essentially? Okay, so I'll begin by, with just a few slides, emphasizing that I genuinely think interactions between glaciers and volcanoes are hugely important. And that's because most of the volcanic eruptions that might spring to mind are probably glacial volcanic, even if you've never thought about it before. So I'll go through some examples in a moment. Um, first of all, you might think, okay, glacial volcano interactions might be interesting, who knows, but probably they're, they're reasonably rare. Um, and this is a figure trying to demonstrate that, that isn't the case. This is a figure from the topmost paper here, actually. Um, what you can see in this picture is the volcanoes of the world. They're actually shown as gray stars, which might be a little bit faded for some of you. Um, but any of the colored stars have either glaciers on top of the volcano, that would be your orange stars, or glaciers within, say, five kilometers or two and a half kilometers. So we would class all of the volcanoes here that have a colored star as glacial volcanic systems, basically. They're throughout the world, with the exclusion of Africa and most of Asia, actually. Um, but there are about 250 uh, glacial volcanic systems on Earth. That's about one fifth of the world's active volcanoes have glaciers uh, in some way interacting with, with volcanic eruptions or volcanic systems. They may not be erupting. So this is a global picture. And it, it looks at some amazing places on Earth, like sub-Antarctic islands going down into West Antarctica. Obviously, Iceland would be a classic place for glacial volcanism. And Kamchatka, here in far northeastern Russia, which is where I started with a picture. Um, as I said, I, I think that most of you, a lot of the eruptions you think of are glacial volcanic, whether you know it or not, at least recent eruptions. Examples include the 2010 eruption of, there were going to be pronunciation issues, <laughs> who knows? Um, you, hopefully many of you either remember this or remember being told about this. This is the eruption that shut down most of European airspace, cost billions in terms of um, delayed flights, cancelled flights, and so on. This was a glacial volcanic eruption. So the volcano erupted through a glacier, and that's interesting in terms of generating things like floods, but it also had some impact on the nature of the eruption. So because you're getting volcano erupting into ice, you get very quick cooling. So the, mag the magma cools very quickly, and that tends to lead to fragmentation that breaks your ash apart into finer and finer particles. So when you get a volcanic eruption underneath an ice cap like this, you're likely to get fine grained ash emitted. And th in this example, that was part of the part that contributed to the wide dispersal, dispersion of this ash, that it was fine grained. Obviously, it was driven by the fact that there was a, a predominant uh, wind direction towards Europe. That was the real issue. But we were still producing fine grained <coughs> ash because of the glacial volcano interaction. So this is one example where glaciers and volcanoes interacting makes the impacts of the eruption worse by making or generating fine grained ash. So in each, each of my slides, well, almost all of them, I provide at least one paper focusing on the topic that I'm talking about. Um, so this just happens to be an example down here in the bottom left-hand corner. For those of you who have wider interest in, uh, in what I'm talking about, you can read much more than the work I've done um, through these papers. So Eyjafjallajökull, the classic example of a glacial volcano interaction. Matt St. Helens in 1980. Um, this didn't erupt through an ice cap, like was the case at Eyjafjallajökull, but it did blow away some glaciers, completely destroy some glaciers, which is a, a glaciologist is a sad time for me. Um, what you can see in the very top left-hand image here, this is just looking down on the volcano. The blue areas are glacial ice. 
drawn by me in this example, hence looking a bit cartoonish. But on the left hand image is what the volcano looked like before the eruption with 15 glaciers. And the right hand image is what it looked like um, straight after the eruption. And actually effectively looks like now with one exception. And what happened is some glaciers got completely destroyed. Glaciers numbered four, for example, um, on the northmost, northernmost extent, completely gone. Some glaciers have their accumulation areas, the bits of the glacier where ice builds up throughout the year, by their uppermost reaches, completely removed. So we say these glaciers were beheaded. They were cut in half. And it's effectively a way of killing a glacier anyway. If your glacier can't accumulate ice, it has no future. Uh, although many of these glaciers still exist because they got covered with ash and they're just sitting there doing nothing, just buried under ash. Um, this um, volcano actually in that caldera, there's now a new glacier, which I think is probably the youngest glacier on Earth because at oldest, it's what, 41 years old, but actually it didn't start forming for a few years after the eruption. But this is definitely a glacier that now sits within this caldera, not shown in this map, but that glacier is I think the youngest glacier on Earth, but I might be wrong, one of the youngest glaciers on Earth. And this was actually a demonstration that if climatic conditions are right, you can grow a glacier really, really quickly um, in five years, probably, maybe shorter. But anyway, this paper, this paper here discusses that issue. I'll show you two more examples just to emphasize that many eruptions that you might think of are glacial volcanic and that they're important. Um, in 1996, um, Gelp erupted, this is in Iceland, sorry, Gelp erupted through the Vatnajökull ice cap. And that's what you can see in this picture here, volcano erupting through glacial ice. All of this brownish, grayish material around the side is ash covering a glacier. And you can see all this concentric crevassing around this melt pit in the middle of the volcano or the middle of the ice. So this is erupting through a big ice cap, the Vatnajökull ice cap. And this was important because it generated a, a big glacial flood um, known as the Jokulhalp, which flooded the south coast of Iceland and washed away a lot of the infrastructure. Um, so this is another example where glacial volcano interactions in one way or another make the impacts of the eruption even worse. By melting the ice, you generate floods and that creates even more problems. But in Iceland, this is interesting. But this doesn't have direct impacts on people so much. I mean, there's infrastructural damage, um, but there are other parts of the world where glacial volcano interactions are genuinely important for people's lives, life and death situations. And the classic example of this is um, Nave, Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia, um, which erupted in 1985. It melted this eruption. It wasn't a very big eruption. It melted glaciers and snow generated a flood that mixed with debris, became a laha, like a big mud flow, flooded down, covered this entire town called Almero, and led to the death of 25,000 people, roughly. So not only is this a glacial volcano interactions interesting in themselves, they are directly important to some people's life and well-being. There's loads you can read about the, the 20, uh, sorry, the 1985 eruption of Nevada del Ruiz. And again, this is, this is important because this is a part of the world where people live in proximity to these volcanoes. Okay. So to kind of finish that, the introductory part of this talk, really, I hope I've emphasized to you, if you didn't think it already, that glacial volcano interactions are important. They generally make things worse. They generate floods, they lead to fine-grained ash production, and they can generate lahars. They're just some of the impacts. As I said at the start, I also think that glacial volcano inter interactions are important because they make monitoring really difficult. If you want to work out if you have a particular volcano, if it's moving towards a phase of being more active, for example, you want to get in the field and start measuring things. And this is just showing some of the ways in which um, volcanoes are monitored. And uh, the citation, sorry, for this figure is at the bottom here. So we use things like GPS, um, airborne monitoring systems, even satellite monitoring systems to look at whether volcanoes are changing in some way. Are they heating up? Are they deforming, changing shape? Various things going on. But if you have your volcano like this one here on the right-hand side, this is an active volcano again in Southern Iceland. No idea how you pronounce this one. Orafjokul, 
This is the highest mountain in Iceland, actually. And what you see here is quite a large caldera. This is a, an active volcano, although it's not actively erupting, covered by part of the Vatnajökull ice cap. And as you can see here, hopefully, having this ice in the way makes doing all the things you'd like to do on the left-hand side much more difficult. Uh, ideally, that glacier wouldn't be there, so you can directly monitor the volcano and try and work out um, what's going on. Is it about to do something interesting that we might want to know about? So this is where my interest in this topic actually started, which was this volcano. Um, and there's a reason for that. And remember, my interest in this topic is kind of saying, look, I know this is a problem. Having a glacier there makes things worse, generally. But maybe these glaciers tell us something about the volcano itself. And we just need to be able to read them for that information. Um, this was the volcano that drew me to it as a topic. And that's because some of you may remember this as well. Who knows? In 2017, so three and a half years ago now, oh, maybe four years ago now, actually, in the surface of this glacier that you can see it's covering the volcano, this melt pit formed. This is in the glacier. So the surface of the glacier had depressed. And this is presumably because there was melt at the bottom of the glacier and the surface of the glacier lowers. And people asked at this point in time, at least on Twitter, they asked, what does this mean? Does this mean that this volcano is reactivating? As you'll see in a moment, it hasn't erupted for a while. Is it reactivating? And therefore, should we be doing something like monitoring more or evacuating? Um, Twitter, Twitter views. But this did get into Icelandic media, for example. Here's just a quote from the Icelandic Review, Iceland Review, sorry. So it is four years ago now. Their quote was, Oriafukul hasn't erupted for 300 years but recent weeks have shown increased activity. A caldera emerged in the glacier a week ago. The, the interesting thing to me here was, they, they say in this quote that there is increased activity. They didn't know there was increased activity. All they knew is that the glacier had done something weird. So they'd made the inference, they'd taken that to mean that something was happening to the volcano. So they've taken the first step towards the work that I'm trying to do, actually, which is to say, when that happens, when you get a surface depression like that, should we be worried? Is something about to happen? In, incidentally, in this case, the answer was no. This is just a bit, I think, from what I gather, this was just some geothermal heating. So the volcano did do something, but it wasn't an imminent eruption indicator. But my... Our work, sorry, um, is now trying to look at whether or not some things like this are indicators of imminent eruptions. In this example, we, we don't think that's what was going on here. And time has already told us that. But we think there might be in instances where the glaciers do tell us something. So the things we're looking into are these two questions here. Um, are glaciers like this one early indicators of volcanic activity? Do they tell us something? before an eruption happens, and if we monitored the glaciers better, we would have a better way of predicting eruptions. And then the second element that I'll come on to is, can you actually use the glaciers to try and quantify how much geothe geothermal heat flux is happening, or volcanic heat flux? So if a, a volcano goes through a 30 year period of getting warmer and warmer and warmer, do glaciers tell us that, even if we're not there monitoring the volcano itself? So we're going on now to think, can glaciers be useful? indicators of volcanic activity in general. So I looked around the world. Well, I didn't leave Manchester, but I looked through the literature from around the world to see how many examples are there where it seems like glaciers did give us an early warning that a volcano was going to erupt, even if at the time it wasn't necessarily seen that way. Um, and one example comes from Mount Redoubt in Alaska, which erupted in 2009. Um, and before the eruption, a month prior to the eruption, the glaciers did something weird. Or oh, there's one glacier, sorry, the glacier did something weird. And what it did is that you had depressions forming in the glacier surface, you had um, fracturing, so crevasses, um, and we had there were melt pits in the glacier. So no one had seen steam emerging from the volcano, but someone flew a plane over and spotted there were holes in the glacier and basically said uh, there's something weird going on here. And then a month later, the volcano erupted. So this is an example where the glacier was telling us something about the volcanic eruption before it happened. 
or before the major eruption had happened. Um, and as part of our work, we're trying to look at examples like this, that this is the same eruption, the same volcano, trying to look from satellite imagery. Could we theoretically have been observing that glacier from satellites and predicted that an eruption was about to happen? I don't have a definitive answer, by the way. But this is just an example of what happened here. You might be able to see it or not. At the top of the screen, it tells you here that this eruption, this volcano erupted in March 2009. So both of the satellite images you can see here on the left are prior to the eruption. This is before the volcano had erupted. So one was more than six months before the left-hand image. We're looking down on the top of a glacier here. And this is what a normal glacier looks like. There are crevasses. There's, this is the glacier flowing to the northwest, sorry. This is a satellite image. There are crevasses, there's some holes from previous eruptions, but the upper part of the glacier is pretty healthy looking. It's what we'd expect the glacier to look like from a satellite image. And then by February 2009, so a month prior to the eruption, the top of the glacier was completely different. There's a, a big hole in it for starters. That should be an indicator that something weird's happening. There's much more crevassing, and some of that crevassing actually extends all the way down the glacier. So even if there'd been no one at this site to, to observe that the glacier had done something a bit weird, satellite imagery tells us that. We know that you can observe satellite imagery to see volcanic impacts on glaciers even prior to big eruptions. Incidentally, this figure, sorry, is from the Lomos paper here. Um, so yeah, that's where you should look if you want more info. This is an example where we don't have a definitive answer to anything. Um, so what I would say, someone to ask me, okay, can you use glacier surface fracturing like this to indicate an eruption is about to happen? Yes, maybe. I know of one example ever, and that's it. So this is what part of our project is trying to do, to see is this really the only time this has ever happened? It seems unlikely, who knows? Or there are loads of other examples that we just never observed. So that's an indicate an instance, sorry, where glacier fracturing happens before an eruption and therefore potentially is an early indicator. Another thing that might, again, the top of the screen might not be clear to you here, but another thing that might happen before an eruption, at least theoretically speaking, is if you get increased geothermal or volcanic heating underneath your glacier, it melts the bed of the glacier, which means all of a sudden your glacier can slide around much more easily on this layer of meltwater. So potentially, if you have months and months of warming building up, I mean, geothermal or volcanic warming building up to an eruption, maybe your glaciers start to speed up in terms of the rate at which they flow. So bear in mind, a glacier like this that's sitting on a volcano is constantly flowing forward, flowing downhill. If you increase the melt at the bed of that glacier, theoretically at least, it should speed up. So maybe glaciers speed up before volcanic eruptions. That's another way we might be able to predict when they're going to happen, or at least better predict. And again, I can find one good example of this. There are a few questionable examples, but one good one, uh, and that's from Volcan Petaroa in Chile, when there were eruptions in 1991 and 2010. And before those eruptions, months before, people noticed that the glaciers had started to accelerate. So the rate at which they were flowing had increased. So again, this is an example where if we were monitoring these glaciers for their velocity, we might be able to see anomalous periods. If you see months and months and months of your glacier getting quicker and quicker and quicker, perhaps someone needs to step in and start checking, is something happening here? Again, this is an example where glacier acceleration is sometimes uh, an early indicator of volcanic activity or an eruption, but who knows how common this is. This is one good example, and there are two other examples I know of, one from Iceland and one from Deception Island, in the Antarctic, but they're less convincing than this one. So maybe glacier acceleration is an early indicator of volcanic activity, but we need to do more work basically to find out if that's true. So I'll press on for now. So that was, sorry, that was the, effectively the second part of the talk was to try and convince you maybe that glaciers can indicate that volcanoes are doing strange things and maybe trigger I don't know, volcano monitoring agencies to go and have a better look is the best way I could put it, basically. If your glaciers are doing something weird, that might be because your volcano is doing something weird. Someone should go and check this. The second part of this talk is, or the third part, sorry, there are four. The third part is thinking about, um, can we actually use 
instances like this, where a glacier is sitting on a volcano, um, to actually work out whether that, that glacier is, sorry, that volcano is producing geothermal heat from the bed, and maybe even work out how much heat it's generating. Because we know that heating is going to cause melt. We can quantify the melt. So therefore, we might be able to work backwards and work out how much heat is required to generate that much ice melt, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, it might be in a moment once we've gone through a little bit of this. So the question here is, can that glacier tell us something about the temperature of the uh, geothermal or volcanic heat flux? Sorry. And again, the, the premise here is that before most or many volcanic eruptions, you get periods of thermal unrest. So it's, you, it's unlikely or not impossible that your, glacier, your volcano sorry, just erupts. You get buildup to this often. Um, and there are a few papers that have focused on this recently. This paper, the top paper here is from uh, 2021. So if we think that geothermal or volcanic heating happened before an eruption, it'd be nice to be able to monitor that at a global scale. But monitoring it is really difficult. It requires equipment, it requires expertise. Often it's localized. There are some volcanoes globally that are really well monitored and there are some that are almost completely ignored. It'd be great if we could do this at a more global scale. And as I've already mentioned, glaciers are a problem. If you want to measure how much heat is being generated by a volcano and whether or not that heat flux is changing, having a huge glacier or even a small glacier sitting on top of it makes it much more difficult. So what we're checking here is can glaciers help? If there's a glacier sitting on top of a volcano like this that's producing geothermal heat, can we, in, uh, can we identify that or can we even quantify that? So I, before I go into thinking in, about that in more detail and looking at some data that's related to that, I just want to remind or tell some of you about glaciers and what we would expect a glacier to be like if it wasn't sitting on a volcano. So a normal glacier, this is what we have in the picture here. And um, normally you have um, the glaciers separated into two areas. The uppermost area where ice accumulates throughout the year and there is more ice accumulation than there is ice melt. That's the accumulation zone. Below that is the ablation zone where throughout a single year you get more ice melts than ice accumulation. There's the topmost area, the accumulation area where ice is building up, a lowermost area where ice is actually melting away, and it's glacier flow that transfers the mass from the top to the bottom. There is also a point on a glacier called the equilibrium line altitude. And this is the point where we assume that throughout a single year, the amount of ice that builds up is exactly a balance by the amount of ice that melts away. It becomes a really important element of a glacier because um, you can track that elevation through time. Um, how high your equilibrium line is, so equilibrium line altitude, is normally determined by climate. So if climate cools, the equilibrium line altitude lowers and your glacier grows. And if the climate warms, for example, your equilibrium altitude moves higher through the landscape and your glacier shrinks. So for a normal glacier like this, the position of the equilibrium altitude is controlled by climate, mostly. And that means how big your glacier is, is controlled by climate, which is an obvious thing to say. I think that glacier size in most parts of the world is governed by climate. That means you can look at a glacier's equilibrium and altitude and use it to say something about climate in the past, at present, and in the future, if you want to. You can track it through time. So we're going to focus on this thing, this equilibrium line altitude, which is normally controlled by climate. And we're going to think about, excuse the graphics, this is not my skill. Um, think about a glacier like this one. So this is a, where the equilibrium altitude is also being controlled by climate. There's a regional climate. Um, but what's happening when you get melts at the base? Does the glacier size respond to that? And let's say, if you get geothermal heating, is your glacier actually smaller than you would expect it to be climatically. And therefore, when you calculate its equilibrium and altitude, is it higher than you would expect, if that makes sense? So there's an altitude based on climate that we'd expect the equilibrium line to lie at. And we're going to look for glaciers like this one. Is their equilibrium line altitude actually higher than you might expect? I.e., is geothermal heating causing ice melt that has a discernible, in, discernible impact on the glacier size? You may or may not be with me. Hopefully we'll be in five minutes, we'll see. So to answer this question, or to start to answer this question, um, what we've done is to go and focus on the Andes. The Andes are a great place to look at glacial volcano interactions. 
The key things are there are 309 active volcanoes. Uh, 69 of them actually have glaciers on them, which is important for us. And they're not the best picture to show it. They are distributed throughout the Andes. There's a big latitudinal spread. Um, so we're looking at the Andes to try and answer this question. Does geothermal heating have an impact on how big the glaciers are, as indicated by the equilibrium lines? And ultimately, can we use that information to, to quantify geothermal heating? Keep going for now. Um, it says at the top here, well, you may or may not be able to see it, criteria for inclusion in our analysis. So we've got these 309 volcanoes. We're not going to look at not all 309, or we, although we would have loved to, not all of them meet the criteria that we need to test whether geothermal heating has an impact on these glaciers. We need volcanoes where they have glaciers on them. So we would call those volcanic glaciers, for want of a better word. But they also have glaciers nearby that we presume are not being influenced by that volcanic activity or that geothermal heating. That means we can work out how big the glaciers should be if it's just climate that matters and compare that to what the glaciers are actually like when they sit on the volcanoes. And that's what this cartoon here is just showing you. We'll come to this every now and then. Our volcanic glaciers are the ones within one kilometer of a volcano. Our non-volcanic ones are the ones between one kilometer and 10 kilometers. So we're just making this broad distinction, volcanic glaciers and non-volcanic glaciers. We can question whether or not that's a good way of doing it, but for now we're doing it. Here are our volcanoes throughout the Andes. 39 volcanoes in total meet the criteria of having volcano, sorry, having glaciers on them and near them, but not on them. And that's more than a thousand glaciers. A lot of equilibrium and altitudes to calculate. So if we did, we're going to do this analysis, calculate the equilibrium line altitude of all of our glaciers, and the volcano has no impact on that might happen. This is kind of what we'd expect to see. The, the, each of these dots in this graph is the equilibrium and altitude of a single hypothetical glacier in this instance. And we're moving away from the volcano along the bottom axis here, up to five kilometers in this example. Yes, there is variability in the equilibrium and altitude from one glacier to another. That does happen, but there's no overarching trend here. There's nothing to suggest that the glaciers on the left-hand side of this graph are fundamentally different from the ones to the right either ones near or on the volcano are different to the ones further away from it. But that is not what our data show. If we go and look for one, uh, one example to start with, Tipas volcano on the Argentina-Chile border, the only photo I could find of it. It's the least spectacular volcano I've ever seen. Not quite. Now we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at the distance from the volcanic source or from the volcano along the, the x-axis. And the y-axis is showing the equilibrium and altitude of individual glaciers. And in this example, there are tens of glaciers in and around that volcano. And hopefully, you agree that there is a clear trend. Equilibrium and altitudes are higher for the glaciers that are right near the volcano than they are for the ones much further away. What this is telling us in the way we calculated equilibrium and altitude, which I can come on to, is that the glaciers to the left-hand side of this graph are smaller than the ones to the right, effectively. If it was just climate that mattered here, we wouldn't expect that disparity. We would expect these equilibrium altitudes to be roughly similar. So this is suggesting that ELA, or glacier size, decreases with distance from a volcano, an active volcano. And actually, this is a pattern from one example. This applies for 81% of volcanoes we looked at. Um, so most of the volcanoes we looked at showed this trend to one degree or another. Obviously, given that I'm showing this one, this was a good one. There are some that are less convincing than this, obviously. Anyway, this appears to hint at that idea, right? That maybe the heating from the volcano is having an impact on the glacier size. I'm going to stop with some of these acronyms in a moment. We'll bring this section to, to, towards the end. For each of our examples, we calculated a single value, which we call delta ELA mean. So this is if you've got all the, for a single volcano like that one, for all the glaciers that are within one kilometer, so what we call volcanic glaciers, calculate their equilibrium altitudes and get the mean value. Then do the same for all the glaciers, for that same volcano that are not as close, basically. So between one kilometer and 10 kilometers. So we've got two values now. We've got the mean equilibrium altitude, mean equilibrium altitude for the very close glaciers, the mean equilibrium altitude for the further away glaciers. And we calculate the difference between those two values. 
that makes sense? So we're taking the group of volcanic glaciers, group of non-volcanic glaciers, taking the equilibrium and altitudes away from each other and seeing if there's a, a systematic difference. And this is the value I'm going to focus on for the next slide or two, this delta ELA. If you calculate delta ELA for all of our um, glaciers, and not, sorry, all of our volcanoes, what we find is that 95% of volcanoes have a, a, a me, uh, sorry, a delta ELA, which is positive. That means that the glaciers that are on the volcano have a higher mean ELA than the glaciers that are around the volcano and not sitting on top of it, basically. So that is a systematic difference for most of our studies, and most of our volcanoes, sorry. And the median difference in those elevations is nearly 300 meters. That's suggesting the ELA offset for volcanic glaciers is roughly 300 meters above what we'd expect climatically speaking. And that's all the, the histogram here is showing, sorry, is the offset between those two values, the mean ELA for the, the volcanic glaciers and the non-volcanic glaciers. And you'll see for, for many of them, we're talking about a couple of hundred meters elevation difference. For some, it's almost a kilometer elevation difference between what you'd expect climatically and what you observe. And one of the questions therefore would be, does this, are these differences, say between one that's showing a kilometre offset versus one that's showing a hundred metres offset, is that because the kilometre offset is for a volcano that's producing a lot of geothermal heat and the minimal offset is for one that's not producing much at all? And that's what we came to look at. Um, hang on, sorry. I will not bother with this one for now. This is showing you that climate is not the controlling factor in how much elevation offset you get. We'll come to it if we need to. So the question would be, you can see this, so what is it that controls that elevation offset? I'm hinting or suggesting that it might be how much geothermal heating there is. When there's a lot of heating, you get a big offset. When there's not a lot, you don't get much at all. So let's test that idea. So 19 of those volcanoes that we've looked at, um, we actually have geothermal um, heat data, basically thermal anomaly data. This is derived from satellites. This is the paper that uh, that information came from. So we know how much geothermal heating or heat they produce between 2000 and 2018. Let's compare that to the, the offset in ELA, that value I just calculated, I told you about. And this is what you find. So this is 19 volcanoes, each dot is a volcano. The y-axis is how much ele elevation difference there is between the climatic equilibrium and altitude and the actual volcanic equilibrium and altitude. That makes sense. And what you see here is a positive relationship. So where you have a big thermal anomaly, you typically have a big offset and vice versa. It's a shame that we've only got 19 volcanoes where we've done this so far, but we, we hope to do this globally, maybe. Who knows? We need better geothermal peak data, really. So this is definitely suggesting that, at least, that the magnitude of the offset between these ELA values likely reflects some sort of geothermal or volcanic heating, heating and the impact that actually has on glacier dimensions. I'm hoping this makes some sense to you. Hard to know. ELA might be the point at which it all collapses. Um, so perhaps, Delta ELA, this value that we can calculate for thousands of glaciers pretty easily, um, is a proxy for thermal anomaly. So if you want to look at global scale thermal anomalies, you might be able to do that at least to some degree by looking at the glaciers. Okay, so this is interesting and potentially you could use a graph like this to convert your ELA offset into a thermal anomaly or off, um, a temperature anomaly. Um, but there are also other ways that we could do that to actually try and get temperature values out of our ELA values. And one thing you could do is, this is potential next steps, by the way, no one's doing this at the moment. Um, you could try and quantify geothermal heat flux by doing the following. You could say that the difference in ELA between what you observe on a volcano and what you might expect climatically is a volume of missing ice. The volcano is removed part of the glacier that we would expect to be there climatically. So if we can work out how much ice is missing, theoretically, we can convert that into actual temperature. So this is what you do. You get the calculate how much missing ice there is, convert that to calories, which can be done, and calculate a heat flux. And as I said, we haven't done this yet, but I'm just going to quickly show you what you would do, what we might do, hopefully. You would look at a, a glacier that's sitting on a volcano, like on the left hand here, observe it work out how much ice there is, roughly. You don't even need to work out how much ice there is, actually. 
observe that, and then you look at what the climatic equilibrium altitude is for that same area, and say this on the right hand side is what we'd expect the glacier to look like if it was only climate that was controlling its size. So if the volcano was having no impact on that. That allows you very simply to deduct one from the other, and you'll get a volume of ice that's missing. Missing ice, as I like to call it. Once you've got your missing ice volume, there are really simple equations where basically the only unknown variable is how much ice is missing. And you can quantify your thermal energy, you know, ice density and the latent heat of fusion for ice, which are effectively knowns. So simple equations like this might allow us to not just observe patterns in geothermal heating, but actually get numbers out. And not just numbers out for now, we can push this back if we can reconstruct past equilibrium altitudes back in time, theoretically. Not too far, though. For the moment, I had no idea what it said at the top of there. And I remember now. Um, okay, this is the, the final bit of my talk, actually. Where I just go through a few slides thinking, theoretically, areas of discussion for, so what the future for glacier volcanism might be. So interactions between glaciers and volcanoes, what happens as the world's climate warms? Um, so as the world's snow and ice continue to decrease, interactions between volcanoes and the cryosphere, snow and ice, will become less common. I think there's very little dispute about that. If glaciers are smaller and in fewer locations, they're going to have less opportunity to interact with volcanic activity. Um, and some currently ice-occupied volcanoes, let's say Nevada del Ruiz in Colombia, might become completely glacier-free. In some respects, that might be good news. Getting rid of glaciers removes part of that hazard for future eruptions. Although snow is a big problem there, but remove the snow as well. I'm not advocating it, I'm just suggesting. Um, and in thinking about what, what we might want to do if we were going to look at um, a glacier like one on the Vado del Ruiz would be my example. Um, you might want to do the sort of thing that you would do for a normal glacier. This is a normal non-volcanic glacier in the Alps. And what people do for glaciers like this is they, they work out roughly how much ice we have at the moment, going back to 1960 here actually, and using different future climate scenarios, predict how much ice there will be at different points in the future. That's what this graph is here. This graph is showing a prediction of what that glacier will look like in terms of ice volume in the future. And you can imagine for Nevada del Ruiz, that might be really helpful if you can work out by 2050, there will be no glacial ice here anymore. That has implications for managing risk, basically. This is what we would like to do, right? Probably. Predict how much ice there'll be in the future. Because that means you can work out for a particular year, let's say for the year 2100, how much ice will be on this volcano. Therefore, how big will Lajas be? You can model this. How big will Lajas be in the future and the different future climate scenarios? If we assume, for example, all the glacial ice melts during the eruption, big assumption. This would be great to do this for volcanoes like Nevada del Ruiz, but it's just not possible at the moment because this step here falls apart. I'm trying to predict the size of a glacier that's sitting on a volcano at some point in the future it's really difficult. It's very difficult to model what the glacier will do in the future for two reasons. One is the glacier is not in climatic equilibrium. That's what I've shown you earlier in the talk. The glacier size at the moment is not a product of just climate. Therefore, trying to predict what that glacier size will be in the future when we have no idea if there's going to be an eruption tomorrow or if geothermal heating is going to increase, this step here becomes incredibly important. Sorry, incredibly difficult. It's very difficult to model how big these glaciers will be in the future. And as I've already mentioned very briefly there, actually, we don't know if there's going to be an eruption at Nevada del Ruiz, well, I say tomorrow, let's say next year. So trying to predict how big a glacier will be in the year 2100 depends. If the glacier gets blown away a year from now, that has a big implication on how big it's going to be at any point of the next century, probably. But I think it's probably safe to say that the overall risk from floods and lahars it's going to gradually diminish as the world's cryosphere shrinks, which is what's happening. The shrinking of the cryosphere has other implications and it reduces stability. If you remove glaciers from a volcano, you have low volume, unstable slopes and debris. That's another issue. But floods and lahars maybe will become less common or become smaller in the future. Okay, so this was kind of saying as glaciers shrink, in some ways the risk will be reduced. And there's the final couple of slides here. 
I just wanted to get you thinking, it just says future based on volcanism at the top, sorry. Let it get people thinking, as you may have done already, some of you, what happens to a volcano when you remove the ice from it? So it's saying the, the glacial ice in some places is basically squashing down on the volcano. And there is a suggestion, at least from the paleo literature, that as glaciers diminish, as they shrink, disappear completely, they um, reduce the pressure on the volcano. So you get decompressional melting um, and maybe you get volcanic eruptions. So in some cases, the reason a volcano might not be erupting is it's got a glacier sitting on it, it's effectively squashing it down. What happens if you melt that ice away? Does the volcano go boom? Um, and the paleo record is where there's evidence for this. Um, and this is just a quick uh, plot on the left showing, if you look at something like Kamchatka, this is in Eastern Russia, volcanic eruptions, which are kind of shown by the bars here, that's how big they are, effectively how much tech is produced. They appear to have clusters and people have looked in the past and have tried to argue that during periods of global deglaciation like coming out of the last glacial period, the number of volcanic eruptions increased and that maybe that was due to this decompressional impact because you melt the ice away, you have more explosive eruptions. Don't think anyone actually knows if it's true or not. They may, maybe people in this room who know. A couple of papers that focus on this topic specifically if you ever want to read about it. And if it is true that if you melt away ice, that can cause volcanic eruptions that might not have occurred otherwise, then it has big implications for places like West Antarctica. West Antarctica is covered by an ice sheet at present. We know, as these papers here tell us, there are currently active, though not erupting, volcanoes underneath that ice sheet. And we know that's an unstable ice sheet. There's a chance that there'll be a lot of ice mass loss over the next few centuries. Will that trigger volcanic eruptions underneath that ice mass? which might lead to even more of a positive feedback mechanism. So knowing whether or not melting a glacier away causes volcanic eruptions is really important, not just for understanding past glacier volcanism, but also thinking about the future of places like Antarctica. It's less relevant when you get really small glaciers. I feel like it's been a powerful tour of smashed through. Final slide, so we can have some questions hopefully. Glacial volcano interactions are common on Earth and elsewhere, Mars. We haven't even touched on things like that. They tend to make things worse, um, and it makes it more difficult to monitor a volcano if you've got a glacier sitting on it. But maybe the glaciers are also useful. We just don't know how to read them for the information they're trying to give us. Maybe they're early indicators of activity. Maybe they tell us about geothermal heating. And maybe we can actually quantify global scale geothermal heating if we can monitor volcanoes. Um, and finally, maybe in the future, there'll be fewer glaciers. There will be. And maybe that will have some impact on how much of a risk or hazard this is. And understanding glacier, uh, sorry, volcano response to glacier unloading is definitely fundamentally important. Thank you. My final point was here. Is we've got a postdoc advertised for this month that if anyone's interested in this, um, can apply for, I think it's the 16th of December, the, the deadline for that, if you want to apply. Um, but other than that, thanks. I'll happily take any questions if you have them.